Because God is the great. 
I just feel we should give the Lord one more, sh one more shout. Just a short shout. Let's let's shout again. There's something in the air. Something great is in the air. Let's give the Lord a shout. He's always been someone who I've always looked up to as an older brother. He's an example of who an older brother should be. As I say, he is what you see is what he's always been like as a little boy. He's always been the responsible one. Whereas we younger ones, we were a bit wayward. Um, yeah, we played all 
we're sort of going together. And um, <laughs> cricket, it was a waste of time because we could never get this man out. <laughs> we could never get him out, but yeah, I mean, the puzzle is who you see. You know, it's not anything else but who he is. He is a true, true man of God. And um, yeah, that's all I can say. Yeah. Like I say, I always, I always think about this on my church. It's like, it's one of these called enough here to talk, but this is, I always think of this. Bless you, process. There's a reason why I asked Bob Glenn to talk, and he hit, hit, hits it on the, on the head. I mean, exactly the same as when I was a child. And I had the childlike faith like when I was a child. Other people mature and they become different in their persona, their character, their daily development. Um, but I've always been like this. And one of the things I've found when I got saved, we had a dear um, lady called Sister Gray. She looked after me um, because there was a lady called Sister Clark uh, who prayed for me every day. Sister Clark died suddenly and Sister Gray took over. We eventually became one of our ministers and representatives in Venezuela. And she kept always said to me, if she saw I was changing, she used to pounce on it. She says, Brother Keith, do not change. Never change. Don't let people make you change. Don't let the positions that you're going in, don't allow it to change you. Be as you are. And that's how God made you. Don't perform for people. Don't put on a show for anybody. Be yourself. And I didn't cry. We had no conversation with other people, did we? He just came and said it exactly as I am. I want to share some, th some things with you that are very important. You are part of God's economy. The Lord's been pressing me hard to come and speak here today because it's not a subject I actually like speaking about. He wants me to speak about finance. And that he has a great financial system that he wants us to tap into even more than we are. I'm going to share bits and pieces around that and we'll look at the Word of God to back everything up, to confirm things. Uh, could you put my, put my CV up please when you have a moment, thank you. I came from humble beginnings. I'm not saying that I'm great now, but my beginnings were humble. And I had lots of enemies when I was small. You can go right to the bottom and we'll do it backwards. I think that will make a little bit more sense. Thank you. Right to the end of it, please. And I, I love school. I really did love school. I loved reading. I was excellent in mathematics and those sort of things and, you know, music. I was a composer at school. I won school prize in composition. And I thought my career in various ways was really going to take off. But at school, things suddenly changed when I was 14. And I don't want to go into the reasons why, 
think some of you understand what I mean. The teachers changed. I won school prizes, but the teachers changed. And I was in a special class even in my junior school. The Cancer Rice School, I was in a special class called the Flower Patch. And that Flower Patch, we were all going to be uh, they taught us then we were all going to university and we were all going to go to grammar school. And I took my 11 plus, which I sailed through very easily, but they never sent me to grammar school. They decided to destroy me. And they sent me to what we classified as a low class school two miles up the road. I was very angry. I never got so angry before. And even in the classroom, they asked the question, who believes in God? And I put my hand down. And two of us stood up, and I was one of them, and I said, I don't believe in God. And even though I grew up with God from the age of five, you know my story, and the angel coming to me, I was really hurting. I saw my future cut off because of the will of man. And I want to say to you today, we must look after our children and our grandchildren and watch over their education very carefully. Do not believe the negative reports of the school teachers about your children unless you know it's true, and that's different. But something negative out of the blue to destroy your future of your children, you must stand strong. Amen. We have children in the university, you know, children in our church here, we in university now that were pulled down by the teachers. And I went to the evening school the evening classes for the teacher classes and parent teachers. And I went there and I just told them the truth. I said, this child is not going to be what you think it's going to be. And the child has just got about a year and a half to, about one year, I think now, to finish their degree. Give them hands, give them all a hand. It's not easy. It's not easy to live in this country at times. So when I left school, I, I had a series of uh, O-levels and so forth. I think I passed out eight O-levels. I should have had two A-levels at school. It didn't happen. The teacher started to interfere with my progress from a grammar school training boy and they decided to destroy me. I cried a lot, but I wasn't depressed. I fought hard. Even though I was 15, 16, I knew there was a war. In 1973, 1972, it seems a long time, well, I was a young kid on the block and I got a lovely job in Barclays Bank. The banks opened up their doors to a lot of young people. Pastor Winnie is an ex-banker. I'm an ex-banker. My good friend Astel, who really led me to the Lord, he was a banker. My other friend Julian, he was a he was a banker, he stayed in the banker. He stayed in the bank and he was the uh, area manager of the Chase Manhattan Bank eventually in London. We had to fight the system. It was not easy. You can see we're talking about the 1970s. We're not talking about the years 2000. We were 1817, that age and we broke into banking, praise the Lord. There's others that we know, my age, 
went into banking. Some are investment bankers today. Some are in business. My encouragement, I don't say at all, is that we're under the economic blessing now. This is the time to start businesses. You must now look at the opportunity of making uh, money and other income streams outside of your secular employment, your main employment. And there's things that you can do. So as a church, we're committed to that and we want to see you break through into those areas. Amen? Uh, when you look at my CV, uh, the bit I want you to see, I was unemployed. I just got saved, 1971, 72 in August, I received the Holy Ghost, 24th of August, I got filled, I was speaking in tongues. Now I've got the bank job, but my job is different than others because I've worked three shifts, I worked nights, days and evenings, because I was into the computers, the computer side of banking. Uh, a friend started to say I was looking tired and I was missing church a lot because I had to miss church because one of my shifts was an evening shift for a whole week. Yeah. One week in a month, I miss church. In those days, they were very strict and they didn't like you doing it. So I asked God to help me, but I knew I was getting tired because in daytime, I was supposed to sleep. And I'm out there on, on the high road shopping and, and then I got to go to work and stay up all night. So the, the bags started to form under my eyes. And I, start, I did start to look very tired. So I decided to leave. I want to give you uh, one advice. Do not leave a job and you're not stepping into the next. Don't leave a job and you have, you've already done your interview at another job. So you leave one job to step into the other one. Never leave a job and you have no job. I did this thinking I was going to be okay. And I went, I left my job in the bank. Now I want to be what I want to be, which was a surveyor, a draftsman, that means doing drawings, architectural, land, or whatever it might be. And I had nothing but blockage. I went to over, now it's going to, it's going to sound like an exaggeration, it's not. There were so many jobs around me. Not like that, and I applied, and I applied, I got three interviews every day. Some two in a day, some three in a day, occasionally one in a day. I, I sat at over 70, seven zero interviews to try and get into the next stage of my life. That's why I put the capitals there, I was unemployed. I was unemployed. And I, I cried out to God. I had a lot of faith though. I never used to be sad about it. I I'm going to get it. I'm going to get it. I'm going to get it. But what I didn't know, that I was now becoming depressed. Because I couldn't get the job I really wanted. So it happened, I'll cut the long story short. The Lord showed up after nine months. I was so proud, I would not go and draw what you call the welfare. They used to call it doll back then. What do they call it now? Universal credit. Universal credit. I was supposed to, but my mum looked after me and she gave me a bit of money every week. So she gave me two pounds a week or five pounds a week, or my dad would. And from that, I survived. And I traveled to church, which was, which was 15 miles, right across London on a 36 bus. Took an hour and a half, two hours to get to church. And I did that every week. 
And from that money, I gave my tithe and I gave my offering. Remember, I'm a new convert. I wasn't even speaking in tongues and all this at first, but I gave my tithe. In fact, it started off with 10 pence tithe, because I was only getting one pound a week. Pastor Winnie was working. She, uh, we hadn't met yet, but our, we, our stories were similar. She was working on Saturdays at Woolworth, and she was getting one pound fifty for the How much? One pound as well. Well, they increased it, though, didn't they? Well, one pound, and she was giving 10 pence as a tithe, and I was doing the same, giving 10p as my tithe, as my tenth to God. See, and not knowing, it was building up something for God to elevate me for the future. Your tithe, your offerings are very precious that you give to God. I'm going to thank you for your faithfulness in this church. You're just wonderful people. Let's put our hands together for one another. Now, don't, don't silence up because we're talking about money. Because right now, you can go on your internet, social media, the newspapers, and it's got everything that is all the problems about money right now. Isn't that true? You can go, you just have to look in the shop window. You can just look at your lives, the pressure of money right now. So we need, we need the answers that God can provide. We need Him right now. That's why I'm saying to you that we, we are in the economic plan of God for ourselves. The church is in a different position. I said we're in a different position. Amen. We're in a different position. Amen. Bless you, Minister Anthony. If you, if you get under this anointing and you just feel to get up and just give an additional offering to God, you do this because, listen, my friends, what I'm about to tell you is going to blow your minds in a minute. I came from humble beginning. That's what I'm trying to say. I was just simple. I'm a simpleton. I don't have much, much more than that. I was not a speaker. I couldn't speak it to save my life. The first message they wanted me to preach, I stood up like a dummy. I read the scripture. It was a youth service. And the sweat just poured down my face. I knew what I was going to say before, and when I stood up, I was blank. And I stood there one minute, two minutes nearly, that's a long time. Then the people said, Amen, blessing Jesus, blessing Lord. Shout from the back, shout over there, blessing Lord. I couldn't say anything because, you see, speaking up here is not as simple as it looks. It's not man's ability when you stand up here. It has to be the Spirit of God. And I said I will never go in the pulpit again. I said that when I was 16. I was in another church wanting me to preach on the youth night. It was a disaster. So you can see I was a person who didn't have much confidence. But this is what happened. If you see my CV, if it's floating up there, you can listen. There's one thing I learned to do. I learned how to balance my natural life and to balance it with my spiritual life. I kept everything in balance. I studied hard. I worked hard at work. But then when it was church work, I came to church and I worked harder in the church. I kept the balance. I did not miss, and I'm not going to go at anybody, but I want you to learn from this man of God. I did not miss church because I had to take my exams tomorrow. Because if you see my results, these are distinctions, mer merits, special, special, uh, uh, there's a commendations in my exams and in my work. 
And you see, I want to say this to you, that you we must learn this from God. How many of you want God to bless you? How many of you want God to bless you and pour out his blessings on you? So listen to this man of God who learned the balance. I know we all need money. Praise the Lord. I know we all need money. Can I go with this? Money is not evil. If anybody told you money is evil, it's a lie. Money is not evil. This money, I don't know where you got it from. I hope you got it from the bank, maybe your friend gave you. But do you know this money could have gone some places? This money could have been in Northumberland or in Nottingham or in Gateshead and where somebody went into the betting shop with the same 10 pounds and put a bet on a horse. I'm trying to be nice with what I'm trying to say. There's other things they could have done with this money. It could have been in a clubhouse. It could have been in a club. And you know what I mean. It could have been an exchange for a drug deal. This same 10 pound could have been in somebody's bag doing a, a drug deal. The money is not evil in itself. It is down to the user of that money. Somebody say that. So if everybody understand money is not a curse and money can be preached about in the church and we mustn't silence that because we're talking about money and go cold about it. I learned how to give. I learned, they must say apostle, learn how to give. And you say, I learned quite quickly that money opens the door for me. I know as a young boy. So we were in church, we're going to say where, but we're in church, our bishop was in charge of that church at that time. I grew up, just got saved, and I, I got my next job. My next job, I'm too ashamed to put it up on the screen. I worked in a factory because I couldn't get the job I wanted. And I worked there for three months. And I couldn't believe the regime. I couldn't believe I still never work in this kind of place. Some of our parents, grandparents worked in those factories. And I worked in that factory. You just walk in and you boot. Jump the first time because it's tea break. It's 10 minutes tea break. By the time you line up to get your tea, boom, you've got that little jump. You've got to run back to your line. And I learned that electronics and wiring, which was a great thing, but it was awful. I got less than I got in the bank now. I've gone from 18 pounds a week, which was higher than most people at the time for my age. Now to 14 pounds a week. And if I got in late, just three minutes after eight in the morning, I'm waiting for the 187 bus, and then it was a slow bus. And you're running down this, this track, and you get there, and you open the door, and you just see some three minutes, and as you're just gonna press the button, get the car, it goes to four. When it's four minutes past eight, they're going to take 15 minutes of my pain for that week. And if you've got a bad run with the 187 bus all week long, you're going to lose a lot of money. That was my life. And I couldn't find a way out. But I, from that job, I, I saved some money. I was a dapper dresser, so I got some I didn't buy suits off the rack. My suits were cut. Mug hair suits, they were cut. I only had 14 pounds a week, but I would get my suits cut, suffered something to I didn't 
have it, but I want them to look like it. There's nothing wrong with it. I want them to look good. Do you understand what I'm saying? And so you've got to have that pride about ourselves. And just because the system is against us, we can rise up against that system. And we can be, be who God wants us to be. And I want it to look right. Amen. We dress different styles now, but listen good, listen good to this. I decided, you know, the bishop was asking for some money. There was a, there was something that came up. They needed about 130 pounds. Now remember now, I'm just 18. And that was a lot of money. It's equivalent to like you say in these days, about 2,000 pounds. We need to raise it. And uh, I'm not boasting. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I want to show you something. And I'm going to be off here quite, I can't say till about 10 past 3, but I'll be there. Listen, I went to prayer at home. I said, Lord, what can I give? What can I give? I needed 120 pounds, and my savings, I had about 85. And I was hearing God those days. I heard the number 75. And I just thought, what? 75? You want to turn out as a devil? Get behind me, you're a liar. 75? So I went to church, and it was a secret, but no one knew who gave what. And I, I, went, I put 75 pounds in the envelope, and I said, Whole church. It wasn't the last church then. But I'm not going to say the number because I don't want to embarrass anybody. But uh, we've got the count. We made the money. So we're expecting, I've given 75, so I'm expecting someone else. I, I've got a little job. I'm in a factory. So I'm expecting everybody else. Come on, you do 20, 30, 40. You know, by the time we had the count, we just made 125 pounds. So this little guy here put 75 in. I put more in than the rest of the church put together. So God was testing me where I'm at. Because you see, he's going to position me for greatness. So he stuck to me and I stuck to what he said to me and I gave that. I'm not prizing any money out of anybody's hands today. I'm just teaching you the principle, which is to go home and fix up on this and learn the principle and give what you can. Because I'm fed up of people saying, oh, that bishop, not us, but just those churches, they just want your money. It's not about your money. We want you to get money. We want you to prosper. We want you to excel. And so when I learned the principle, I gave her 75 pounds. One day, I still can't get a job. And I'm really fed up and I'm, I'm, with, I'm with my cousin, you know. And she has a, a boyfriend at the time. And uh, he's usually, he's, he's got a red stripe or tenants. He's always drinking. Doesn't seem quite sensible. And he says to me, Keith, have you seen this job? I said, what job? He said, don't think you see it, it's in the paper. I said, what do you mean? He says, I says, it's something about, you want to be a draftsman, right? I said, yeah, I do. He says, here it is. This is after nine months searching, nothing, right? And he goes, look, there's a job. And he tears it up the paper. Apply for it. I said, oh, no, I've been doing it. Nine months now, I don't think it's going to work. He says, you might as well try. He's not a Christian. He's not prophesying over me. He's got no authority, but God used him. Because I was at the end of my tether, and some of you here at the end of your tether, when it comes to your breakthrough in your job, in your business, or whatever you were asking God for. Because remember, when you give money, it's not about necessarily getting money back. God will give you things to you that are more important than money. God will give you a 
good husband. Yeah. It'll give you good wine. Yeah. It'll give you your house when you come get the mortgage. Yeah. Pastor, we know my poor pastor with him because we need a day. I'll say it now for I might forget it. The day we couldn't get a mortgage. Salary wasn't enough, we just got married. And all of a sudden, the local council sent out an edict. We are giving a giving hundred people in the power of when we're giving a hundred people one hundred percent mortgage. We we applied, we got a hundred percent mortgage, no deposit. To help you. 
And we always give more than that, right? We'll give you two pounds. Make sure before you go to spending, give God back 20 pounds. Because God wants to get you out of the poverty. And what will get you out of the poverty is your insurance policy. It's an insurance policy. Because the world is now messed up financially and it's going to get worse. And God's angels and God is waiting for when it really gets really bad. And in the midst of this, God's people, God's finance, God's economy is going to kick in. Someone say amen. amen. And so, I became all these things. Uh, 1983, 85, I was National Youth Director. So when God opened the door. I went to the civil service and uh, I did really well there. I took my A level exams there, the civil service exams. I went on to a diploma in theology, a uh, distinction in the United Pentecostal Church. I took my national certificate in property management. And I, I then, this is what I, I'm trying to say to you, I didn't believe God. I, in this side, I did my studies for the ministry. Praise the Lord. All at the same time. And I got my love, I became a local licensed minister in 1983. Then they promoted me as the national youth director of Great Britain and Ireland. Then I took, next year, I took my higher national certificate in property management and estate management and valuation and so on. Now after that, I took the third year, because I was part-timer, I took the third year of state management degree in 1985. All the time moving up. More money given to me from God is the more I gave back to him. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. It does take a while to get used to what I'm saying, but I'm telling you, when, when you give to God, uh, and you do it with joy, and you don't look back and say, oh, why did I give that? Or you don't look back and say, oh, they just control me to give. No, no, no. Don't give if you don't want to. I'm not forcing anybody to give. I don't want to get upset if you don't like what I'm saying. Just understand, I've got to teach what the Lord has asked me to teach. Jesus, he was very, very careful with money. Now, let me just kick off quickly. Everyone say this. What I said to you, Jesus was never poor. He was never poor. The church system has made Jesus look poor. He was not poor from the beginning. Because three kings came to give him supply, financial benefit for the, the rest of his life before he, he died. He was not broke. I said he was not broke. He was not broke. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> when Jesus was with his disciples, he had a treasurer. You don't have a treasurer if all you've got is 50p. If you're broke, you don't have a treasure. You just live on as money comes and money goes. You, if you have a treasurer, it means you've got a lot of money. And unfortunately it was Judas that was the treasure. And Judas was stealing the money. And though he was stealing the money, there was still more than enough money. Jesus had the money. Yeah. And someone said, oh well, wasn't it that they came for, they wanted Jesus to pay his taxes. Why didn't he take it from what was called the bag, from the treasury? You see, he didn't take it because he was, it was a, that, the insignia was about Rome. And the money that he got at his birth, and also from his stepdaddy, who was a businessman, he was not going to take the money from the 
finish this and he was not going to take the money that he got from the free kings and pay Caesar. So this money here that we've got came from my father. It came from my father. It came from my natural stepfather. I'm not going to take that money and give it to Caesar. So he said, hey guys, why don't you go up to the stream, there'll be a fish there, and then there will be a coin with Caesar's insignia on it, pay my taxes. The Lord is saying, you, the Lord's not going to make us broke to pay this world. That's what he's trying to say. It's not going to make us be broke to pay all the demands of this world. He's going to keep us outside of it. That's what Jesus was doing. Let everybody know that this world is not going to dictate his money. Amen. I don't know if that went over your head or not. If it didn't, give the Lord a clap. Amen. Jesus taught, this is another part people get this wrong. He taught that when you go to preach for your own people, uh, don't take any money. When you go to preach for people you don't know, he says, take money. People don't know that scripture in the scripture. He, he said, when you go to preach for people you don't know, you don't have to take a script, don't take a cup, don't take a, even, don't even take a Bible. Just go along. They will look after you because they're from your spiritual family. He said, but when you go to some other places, like when we go to Pakistan, we're out there, it's rough for them. We've got to bring the money. We have to bring money to set up the whole crusade. We have to do all these things. We have to set the money for them to buy, to get a bus, so to drive us around. That, so you have them to provide it. There are two systems there. So the church has to be rich enough to do those things. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody. Praise the Lord. Everyone say, devil, I want my money. And I want it now. The devil does not want you to have money. So say, say it like you're angry. Devil, I want my money. And I want it now. God's way, amen. God's way, God's way, God's way. Amen. Right, let me move on really fast. This is what it says in the Bible. Proverbs 13, 22 says, A good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. And the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. So the world is full of sin. And a lot of those guys, they've got the money. But God is saying he's going to do a shift on this. He's going to do a shift. But God, before he shifts for you, he's got to look into your account. He's got to look into your account. So I will share some couple of things with you and you might be shocked. But do you know, Pastor and I, we've given to the Lord bulk money from our own monies. We did it for the Lord. And when we gave the bulk money to the Lord for his work, not for us, not even for our church here. We've given money. And when we did that, that's where all of my promotions took off. Someone say amen. amen. Now let me give you, uh, I, uh, I went right to the top as a director. I don't want to go through, you, you can see it on the screen, maybe not, it doesn't matter. But I went through a, a whole myriad of promotion. In the church, I went through promoted, promoted, promoted. In the world, I was promoted, 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 promoted. Promoted, and I got to the top of my profession. I got on the top, I don't say the top in the church, because I don't think that way. But in the world system, and I tell you how I did it. God gave me wisdom. He says, once you're in your thirties, once you're in your thirties, don't stay in a job more than three years. Well, the 40s and now the 30s, aren't they? So if you're in your 40s, don't stay, if you're working for an employer, don't stay there more than three years. Move out. 
Use that as a stepping stone. You're down here, and you need to be promoted. You've got to be recognized. But if you stay there, now, you, the organizations where the pension schemes move from within that organization to different places, you need to move up. If I have a chair, I'm like, here we go. I can do this now, I can do this last week. You need to move up. You need to move up. Three years later, you move up. Three years later, you move up. You have to have that dynamic in your head and in your heart. You've got to have it. And I know some of you work in some great businesses, but if they're not promoting you, you look around, don't lose your pension schemes, but I move up. But your time is your insurance scheme. Because, you see, like on any insurance scheme, if you don't pay one month's due and something happens, they won't pay that. God's system is the same. So you must practice that when you have the tenth, give it. But the bill's coming! The bill's coming! And if we don't pay that... See, that's the trap of the enemy. That's the entrapment. You say, that's irresponsible. Apostle, that is irresponsible! It's because you have not yet learned the way of Christ. It is the learning curve. And it's very important to know that this learning curve really works. Amen. So I would give, we could bump money. When I say bump money, I mean five figures, five figures in an offering. When I was working, that's what I would do. I bless the church. And that's what you've got to do. Am I asking for that today? No. Am I asking that of you? No. I'm asking to learn. Because we've opened doors for you. Yeah. 1992, I got my redundancy paper from the London Borough Bridge. I'm in my second house, which I think is here in Watford. Just moved in. Just arrived. You'll, you'll feel pride and joy just looking at your home where you are now. And I was working. I was preaching and working. I was very tall. And me, the ministry, very hard. But I got the letter that it was now October, on the 31st of December, your job is done. We are going to re-interview everybody, but at a lower level, watch, they're demoting me, stepping me down, and there's 15 of us, all supervisors, and they're setting us, putting us down. Some of us were Christians, some of us weren't. But that's immaterial. I'm just trying to make the point that what did I do? How did I get out of it? I was the only person that got promoted through that system of downgrade. How did I do it? Can anyone guess? What did I do? Someone said the word. What did I give? I gave an offer. Because what the devil is doing to get rid of us, for whatever reasons he's trying to get rid of us, like when I was a little boy, they just wanted to get rid of me from 
things go, I could see the whole thing restarting. So to stop him, I put a big offering in the offering plate secretly when Sunday arrived. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. People above me, everybody was reorganized. Uh, the whole thing was crazy. They bought an American system called assessment center, was new at the time, and all the staff, about 200 of us, all went through that system. The majority all failed it, even the managers and one of the directors also failed the exam that I took. I passed it. I was the only one to pass it. And when I passed it, they said my results were like the director's level. Who could have done that? He said, it was me. No, no, it wasn't me. It was something to do about what I sold. I sold a tree. I sold a tree of prosperity. I sold a tree of prosperity that whoever wants to take me down can't. It's impossible. They can't cut me down because I sold a tree. I sold good money into the kingdom of God, not to the pastor, not to the church, but to Jesus. I sold it to him. That's why Jesus took so much time over that little lady who came with two farthings. Farthings are a quarter of a penny that you have now. And you try to do it. Jesus said, Look what she's given. You all got lots of money stacked up somewhere. She's got nothing. She's given more than you all. And she gave in the right way. Because I remember hearing, uh, I can't thought to say his name, but he saw angels one day at an offering. And the angels came and they look at the person who gives and the attitude they give, and they write it down in their book, and the amount they give. The amount is not the important thing, it's the attitude in which we give. And we do well at this church. Put your hands together for each other. But I want to teach you this, because sometimes your big breakthrough is on that. Hallelujah. Someone say hallelujah. 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 Now God says he will fill this house with glory. And in the same context he says the silver and the gold is mine. The glory of the latter house shall be greater than the first. Of Haggai 2, 6 and 9. Uh, if the children are making quite expressive, I uh, can tell you why. The children knew my voice when... Uh, they were in the wombs. So the children make noise because of that, because they hear my voice. It's always happened to me since I've been a pastor. So I'm not having a go at the parents, I'm just trying to say, uh, if you can help us, that'd be great. Revelation 6 5, it says, When the Lamb had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And behold, there was a black horse. He that sat upon him had a pair of balances in his hands. And speaking of justice. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny. A measure of wheat. In those days, a penny was a day's wage. So he's saying, This horse. The four horsemen of the apocalypse, speaking of the end times which we are currently in. You have to protect yourselves. And you protect yourselves with your insurance policy. Amen. And you give your tenth to God. God will protect you. He'll send angels to you. It, no man will destroy you. Come on, somebody. You see, I, 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 could, I could tell you as it really is, and when I say that, I can tell you a 
about the crises that I've had to face. Crises. Contracts. That I entered into and it was all going wrong. Contracts. The money is supposed to be provided for a particular contract. When I rang the company, they said, Oh, we don't have your name, Mr. McLeod. Oh, you, we, you, you don't seem to exist on our system. I've got a contract for tomorrow and nobody's got any money that I paid in for, applied for, which you confirmed I will have. It wasn't there. But I said to God, God, I give to you every week. God, I don't know what's going on. I don't know who's trying to stitch me up, but God, I have trust you. God, I've given to you from I was young. I've always given you. I've always given you. Lord, I'm in trouble. They're going to come for me. They'll make me bankrupt. And all this, and I was talking to God like that. And then I rushed out the door and I was crying. Pastor Willie took my, uh, my head in my chest and I was weeping like a baby. I thought it was the end. But I was trusting God, but my heart broke. Nothing works when your heart breaks. And I rushed out, something Bishop you were with in prayer in London. I knew it was on, we had prayer in London every Tuesday. I went down, I burst through the door, and they said, oh, Bishop's here, come and take over the prayer meeting. I said, no, 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 no. I don't want to take it. I, I couldn't even pray. I said, God was, I was under pressure. I went down, I put, sorry, I'm not going to move around too much. I put my head in the settee and I cried. My head, I was popping my head like this. I said, Jesus, where is the application? Where's that money? And let me tell you, it was six figures, my friends. Wasn't a hundred pounds. It was six figures, and it was a mess. I got my head, and I was bouncing. These guys were praying away. They didn't know what I was there for. And all of a sudden, I had a vision. There was a man. He was dressed in black. It was right before my eyes. He had a red ribbon around a piece of paper. It was the contract. I shouted. I said, take it now. I just kept saying, I take it now. I take it now. I knew I got it. Whatever they were hiding, whatever they were trying to stitch me up on, whatever they were going to try and do the deal with someone else and mess me up, I knew in the morning, nine o'clock, I rang them. I said, hello, this is Mr. McConnell. I uh, believe I'm expecting this deal to come through, whatever, whatever, whatever. He said, oh, oh yes, oh yes, Mr. McConnell, thank you. Uh, all is well, all is done, all, all is fine. But I went through hell together. I said, I went through hell together. I'm saying to us in the name of Jesus that the God that we serve, it's not you giving that amount in an offering or a time. It's just you doing your bit. And when you do your bit, it equates to millions. I had to learn how to do it. It wasn't easy at first, but I'm saying to you, it's not about the giving. It's about the getting. It's about what you're going to receive from God in this terrible season. The interest rates are going up and all kinds of stuff is happening. We're in a time where money, you don't know where it's going to go. But in my lifestyle, my lifespan, I believe, Pastor Bill, this is our third or fourth crisis that we've lived through. And I can say, we can put our hand on the heart, if you trust in God, you will come through. This is the time where property
property prices will begin to crash. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. This is the time you will be able to buy properties. Just listen to this preacher who's got experience. It's time to start businesses. You don't start business when everything is well. You start business when things are bad. When there is a need, when there is a niche, you start business. You start to look after. Look, what, look what, the way I put it. Um, how many of you, how many of you know there's, uh, there's two brothers? They do cooking. On TV sometimes. Does anyone know them? Their names begin with M. Mac. They do cooking. You don't see them? They're big men. Their name is Mac Enough. Anyone heard of them? Go on your big cooking. All it was, they loved their mum cooking and they just replicated it there. And I don't know if they're billionaires or whatever they are. I grew up with their dad. We got saved in the same church. It's still, I was one of still his Facebook friend. He asked me to pray for things because we were friends. And you see my brothers and sisters, right there in your family, you're sitting on millions. Come on, somebody. You're sitting on a lot of money. You're sitting on a lot of money. Thank you, Glenn, for sharing what you should be sharing. God took me from very humble beginnings. The world began to trust me with their money. And that's why we can trust them with your money. Because the world outside trusted kids and cow with their money. So when I got elevated, I'm talking about 1993 now, I'd go and uh, various estates I looked after and some various building programs. And I had the, the money that was given to me to pay the contractors. So I had a check every month. And all the managing agents had to meet with me personally to get me a pay. Once a month. That's just for the one contract. I got 5,000 properties I'm in charge of. 47 staff, range of all colours, Asian, African, West Indian, British, English, Irish, and European. And they all got on with me. Not all first uh, to, you know, help them. But in the end, we had a great team. We won, I won the contracts for them three, four times. Every three, four years, the contracts, I won it for them. When they put me in that job, I told them, my bosses, I will only go into it if you secure my position. Don't move out from where you are into a less secure position. Don't do it. Don't do it. So they, I was secure I had a life, a lifetime job in the council as a tenancy services manager. Now I'm an area director, area manager, an area director. And now I'm going to be a director of what's called a particular area. Now they wanted me to take that four-year, four-year job. When I, before that, I had a lifetime job. Take the four-year job, you get a bit more money, but 
But if it goes bad, I'm out. So I told them, I will take that position on your one proviso that if anything goes bad, I will revert back to my tenancy service. I said, manager of this was good money. And you know what? They agreed. Because everyone will agree with you when you give your insurance money to God. Because these insurance angels are on your job. They're working for you. If you see it like this, it's easier to give. It's an investment. It's an investment. Come on, somebody. Come on. You see, the Lord's interest rate is not 5%. It's 30%. It's 60%. It's a hundred percent. And sometimes it's a thousand percent percent. That's the Lord's interest rate. And that's why you give to him. You say, well, no, I'm, no, I'm giving it to that church. And that, that pastor, he's just spending the money. And all of this. No, 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 no. That's why I'm saying I'm safe with the money. Amen. Because I looked after millions of times. And when the bosses came down and got the police. And arrested some of my fellow area directors and put them out for overspending. I never overspent one penny any year that I was in charge. I learned how to, to save money. Someone said, someone said, this is a miracle right now. This is a miracle. This is a miracle. Everyone's point to the ground and say, this is a miracle. Going back to my young years and I'm closing now. As young and old, a little bit young and old, young girl, went to a conference in Los Angeles. Just about paid a ticket. I am married. I had twenty dollars for the week. But it had big breakfast in the hotel free part of the package. So I'll have a big, mighty breakfast early in the morning yeah. to keep me the whole day because I can't buy dinner. Yeah. And I didn't know anybody there over there. Except my cousin who lives in California, there are two of them. They met me in the day. First night, the offering plate came around. I'm there seven days now, right? So first night, I've got six more days to go. I've got 20 dollars. I like to buy myself some fresh, you know, mints at least. And so I'm there sitting. I said, Lord, who's asked the Lord, what should I get? I said, what do you want me to get? And the worst thing God could have said to me, what do you think he said? Give the 20 dollars? So I, I kind of said, Lord, I was saying, well, what's that you? Well, I knew it was him. And I released it slowly in the bucket. I was trying to. I said, Lord, I'm going to have to fast the rest of the week. I'm going to have to eat. can't buy anything. I didn't know anything. Next to me here was a young, we're about the same age, a young Jewish child. We didn't know he was out of the first city, so you don't know who your neighbor is. And he, uh, I don't know, I was watching him. He just got offering time, he's getting too happy. And I wasn't, I wasn't that good at giving him. And he's going, oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. And he's shaking on, and he's vibrating on this, vibrating on I thought, I thought he was going to punch me when he get away from me. So he's going, going, carry on, really loud. He's like he's going to fall on the ground. Offering's over. And I watched him. I asked him if he was okay. He said, I'm fine. And then he then told him and got his bag. Knowing this, he didn't know what I gave. He went down. He says, My brother, I don't know what it is. But the Lord just told me to give you some money. He said, The Lord just told me to give you 20 dollars. And 
Very serious. Who looks after? God was not going to let me starve all week. He wanted to make sure I was okay. And this is the loving God we serve. It's a simple message today. It's not one of my usual preachings. It is not push for you to give. I'm not doing that. Don't go away from here and say the apostles trying to force us to give. I am not. I'm just teaching you God's insurance policy. Accept it or reject it. But I'm going to always tie myself into it because it's helped me all through my life. The Lord bless you, keep you. His face shine on you. I came to walk for. I came to walk. We came to walk for. Sorry, Pastor. We came to walk for it. And nowhere to live. Couldn't find a place. The house in London was in the crash. It was in the same like this. And it was dropping a thousand a week. A thousand a week. No, no exaggeration. In its, in its price, the sale price was going down. We just started our church here. I was looking after the church in High Wick in Buckinghamshire, driving around 111 miles every, every Sunday, preaching four times a day. And uh, the house where we live in now, that's the miracle. We went, and I said, God, I don't have time to be searching, I just want a good house. And so we went to the house where we live now, and it was just lovely. It was five bedrooms. Pastor walked in, the kitchen, the kitchen, the kitchen. The kitchen before, I could touch the wall this side and that side. I touched both right across, it was a tiny kitchen. And uh, the owner was a business, and his wife, Look where God took us. His wife, first marriage, she's married to Lord Bailey Manning of the House of Lords. The husband now is a big financial man. So his wife was sick and problems with her womb. And he told us, I said, okay. We'll try to sell, we'll be back, come back in two weeks. They said, come back in two weeks. If you can't sell, just come back and see us. I was going to pray for your wife. And yes, I prayed for his wife. And I don't know. God fixed the womb. God fixed the womb. I don't know. So we came back, and I was, I was almost like tears outside. I said, honey, we're not going to get this house. And they opened up the door. I said, oh, come in. They were so happy, come in, come in, come in. That's why you must always testify about Jesus. You know, you're talking to people about Jesus, you never know what it will trigger. Don't be scared, just tell people about Jesus. You don't know what it will trigger. And so we can't sell our free bedroom in, in London. This man, his name's Brian. God bless him, Brian Monday, that's his name. Brian says to me, Keith, I've got it all worked out for you. In fact, his dad was there, a lay Baptist preacher. He says, I've heard you've been going around every Sunday, 111 miles. He says, we want to help you. We'll try and put a stop to that. He says, we want you to have this house. He says, we want you to have this house because what you do with it for my wife. For my, my daughter in law, her womb was fixed after she prayed. We want you to have this house. And Brian said something crazy. He says, I'm building a new house just up, about two miles away. I've got an open field. He's building like a million pound house. He says, But I will reward you. He says, I'm going to take your house. Give me your house in London. And you move in here. He says, you cut down the price of my house. I was a bit, what do you mean you cut down the price? He said, don't you worry. I've got to you cut down the price of the, the, the house in London. And he cut down his price. Because his house, at the time, what's this, 
Mexico, it's 1988, you know? There's 150,000 men. Then he cut it right down to 115. Then he worked out the standard duty, which was 30,000. And he worked out we didn't have to pay a penny. I, I couldn't work out the math. I couldn't understand it. But this is because of the insurance policy. And I thought insurance policy about money and finance and so do you. But you need to use it. You need to invest in it. Because if God's done this for me, this little brother Keith that was here with brother Glenn, all these years, I have always known I'm the most special person. I'm a special person. I'm not. God has prospered it for you. God has used me to pray for so many footballers. Right here, Sue Reeves used to come here for four years. I personally mentored him. Pray for a young boy who helped Mother Hazel to come to this church. The parents passed, prayed for his son. He got into a cabin with Arsenal. Now, so in West Ham, he played for Coventry for a number of years, now he's playing in China. It's various people like that. Beckford, who's heard of Beckford? He does the programs. Beckford, I pray for Beckford. The guy with, he does the uh, Channel 4 and the BBC. He talks about, you know, the history, the black history. I pray for him in Birmingham. I was preaching, teaching business people that morning, 8 o'clock service. He came forward, I laid hands on him, prophesied. I said, I didn't know what he was doing. I said, the Lord is going to open doors for you. You're going to be on television. You're going to affect the nation. He's doing that now. I want you to understand there's a blessing in this church. Amen. It is not Keith McCloud. I am just his blessing. It is him. Amen. So him alone be glory. So him alone be glory and honor. Could you stand on your feet and put your hands together? transfers that took place in the Old Testament. One when Joseph he took the whole of Egypt's wealth into his hands. There's another transfer's wealth from Egypt through Moses' hands. There's another tra transfer of wealth from the even world into the hands of Solomon. There's another transfer coming to God's people in this generation. Amen. Put your hands up and give God praise. Someone give the Lord a shout in you. There's another transfer coming to the church of Jesus Christ. We are the apple of his eye. He loves you, he loves us, he loves me. Every offering that you've given over the years of your life, whether you're just beginning to give or you've given for 30, 40 years, that is stacked up in heaven. There is a heavenly account with your name on. That account has got the finances for your future in it. Not when we get to heaven. It's been laid up for this generation. Come on! Give a clap to the Lord! 
up separately. But we have to get out of our heads the belief systems of Roman Catholicism, Church of England. Uh, I passed the Cape of Church of England. I came from the Baptist, and where Jesus was a poorly little man. He was never poor. When he died, they were fighting over his coat. You don't fight over someone's robe if it's a poor man's coat. They were, he was a, a wonderful example of the riches of his father. I want us to understand this, that you see, the kingdom of God is coming now. It's your opportunities now to look at business. What are you good at? What do you like doing in your home, in your house? And you are special. Cakes, food, that's your business. It will turn you into a millionaire. It just has to be managed right. in your position. Close your eyes right now. God is changing your position. Now, I will open this door to lay hands on your hands for all those who believe God is taking you into business. Come forward.
Put your hands together and cut your hands like a cup. Put your hands together. Put your hands like a cup of the bowl. I'm going to anoint your hands. I'm anointing you for business acumen. I'm anointing you for business acumen. You need to believe this preacher. You need to believe. I haven't told you on me anything yet about myself. I became a director. They sent me on a course, a crash course, on business, for senior business director. Never said business director. Senior business director. And I took the exams and I came out with such high marks that the, the, the Don from Manchester University called my executive director to say, oh, this young man answered the question so well. And they came down and the three of us met. Is that right, Pastor Marie? Pastor Marissa, you at your postgraduate day, Mr. Blake, the lawyer teacher, you were in the room and I walked these to teach you. I sat up there. I've seen for years. He goes, Oh, Mr. McLeod! When Pastor Minister was there, and he said, He was my best student. Remember that, Pastor Minister? And that's what I'm See, when I anoint you, this is going to pass through you. It was that I was sick. Put a smile on your face, amen. Put a smile on your face. God's going to increase your mental ability. He's going to increase your ability to remember things. And to take on new things that are difficult. But you will be like Joseph. The character of Joseph. That was the word that was said to Minister Antony.
the Holy Spirit is telling me some of you have lost finances. Some of you have lost opportunities.